tonight's topic is about being alone but not lonely. Yeah. yeah. And I know you're going to pick that apart for us over the next 40 minutes and then everybody can ask questions as a question and answer button okay. and people will be asking questions so before i vanish what is the what is the secret of having deep and meaningful relationships that but not having to um have them all around you so you have space for yourself and still have deep and meaningful relationships. And I guess that's what I would like to do. <laughs> I'm just getting in. <laughs> before I think there might, be, there might be a book in that question. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think there's probably several books that um, have been written down through the years. But I think one of the things that um, that allows you to, to move, to flow, if you like, through a series of relationships in a non-sticky way is um this absence of neediness mm. you know as soon as there's a kind of neediness that comes through in your personality and we all have it to some degree or other needing of approval and needing of acceptance etc as soon as i can get free of that then my relationships will be much um, healthier they'll never be perfect because the other side the other person the person who you're relating to if they have their own um kind of neediness their own form of neediness then that's a challenge in itself but i think that's one of the main things that um that helps many mm -hmm. many factors many many factors okay <laughs> well it's 6 30 um okay. over 200 people have joined us so i have to get out of the way okay. i will be back for the question and answer section thank you everyone for uh, tuning in to this particular um evening uh, i don't know what it is is it a lecture is it a q a it's probably a little bit of both but as you know the the topic is um is how to be uh, alone without feeling lonely and 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 if i look at this way sometimes it's because i'm kind of facing my garden out there so i might kind of stare out into the infinite sky and just uh, gather my thoughts occasionally and uh, the reason, the, the particular reason for this, uh, picking this topic is I think um, um, the past three, four, five weeks now, we've all been more or less in some kind of what's called lockdown. And many people, they find that quite difficult. They do find it difficult to be alone. They find it difficult to, 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 to deal with what they might uh, term as a kind of loneliness. And, uh, and so I thought I might kind of explore this as much for myself as anything else, just to sort of see exactly what's the difference between alone and loneliness and why we fear being alone and why we fear the loneliness itself and, and, and why this kind of anxiety hangs around in the background because of, um, because of these conditions. And especially appropriate because of this time that we're living through at this particular moment. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with um, one of the most popular phrases on most wisdom paths. And, and, and most people nod their head in recognition and agreement when they hear this phrase. This is kind, of, it's kind of even an aphorism, I guess. And it goes something like this, is that we come alone and, uh, and we go alone. And, uh, and, and between the coming and the going, life happens, basically. And, and we're living our life right now. But what we do is we spend most of our life trying not to be alone. And uh, uh, what we don't realize is that the whole of our life, we are alone anyway, even when we're in a crowd. And sometimes that crowd, as we all know very well, is called a family. And uh, even in the context of those relationships, there's often the feeling of, of being lonely and uh and so um my kind of inquiry my kind of question was why is this the case why do we why do we often feel lonely in a crowd and and it kind of took me into this idea that um we're again we often hear that is that we're social beings that is that it's healthy to be a social being it's unhealthy to be alone to even consider um being on your own in fact, it's um, that's considered to be unsocial sometimes. So I was thinking um, 
um, are we social beings? Uh, and, and when you go every Saturday afternoon, maybe to a to a, a, a football match or somewhere where there's a crowd scene, you, you see people socialising in a in a very very busy way. Um, uh, but then my question is, are they being social or are they being dependent? In other words, have we become dependent beings instead of being social beings? Have we gone too far down the other end of the spectrum? And when you watch a football crowd, then you see most people are dependent on the crowd for, well, for a sense of who they are, for, for their emotional state, etc. And, and even in relationships, you know, if you meet a couple sometimes, or maybe you've been in a relationship with someone else, and, um, and, and while you're socializing, there's this feeling of, of dependency. Some, some couples start out where one is more dependent on the other, or maybe um, over time, they both become dependent on each other, and it goes so far as to become a, a, a kind of codependency. I think we've all heard of that and we all kind of acknowledge that to be dependent on anyone is, is not a healthy, a healthy way to be. So my sense is that, that while we are social beings, we've become much more like dependent beings. And then my question was, well, why is that? What's taken us to the far end of that spectrum in an unhealthy way? Why are we are we more dependent on, on other people, on, on stimulation, on, on, on some kind of context in which we want to be in all the time? And, and I think it's um, something to do with, with the fact that we, at a very young age, we become very attached to things. We become attached to people, attached to objects, attached to relationships. And, uh, and, and I don't think that's a new idea. I don't think it's... Um, I don't think it's uh, uncommon. And, and we all know what we're kind of attached to. And, and you kind of know what you're attached to because if you imagine life without that person, that object or that condition, that job, then immediately a kind of anxiety rears its head in the background. And so where there's attachment to anything, attachment and dependency, they kind of go together then there'll always be some form of fear. And one of the main forms of fear, which I think most people kind of deal with most days is this idea of anxiety. So um, I was then asking the question, well, why do we become attached to things? Why, why are we so easily um, <laughs> sold, if you like, so easily um, addicted to the stimulation of another person, of a job, of, of entertainment, of, of, of stimulation, basically. Why are we addicted to stimulation? So to just take it one level deeper, my sense was, um, is that actually what we're looking for every time we become attached or dependent is a sense of security. And I think this is, this is the kind of the key really is, is that, um, we're all searching for a sense of security in our life. And um, then I kind of went a little level deeper and uh, <clears throat> started to explore, well, why is it that we feel so insecure most of the time on our journey through life? Why is insecurity such a common internal state of being basically? And, uh, and I think we all kind of go through three main phases. This, is, this was what I was kind of seeing, is that there's three phases we all go through from the moment that we arrive to live our life um, in whatever context, in whatever culture, in whatever part of, of the world. And, and it's this moment when we arrive, when we're born, is that we're... we're on the end of an onslaught, really, of energies which don't affirm our well-being. There, there, yeah, maybe there's occasional loving energies and, and, and if, you like to, if you'd like to say healthy energies, but there's also um, mostly a number of other energies. Sometimes we call them emotions, 
um, anxiety, irritation, sadness, um, fear. And they come at us very quickly when we're born because those people around us tend to be, different for different people, of course, tend to be um, expressing such emotions on a regular basis. So when we arrive, when we're born and we're faced with this onslaught of, of emotional projection from those around us, we have to deal with it. We have to respond to it. We have to react to it. And most of our reactions, because they're, they're not um, affirming the wellness of our being, most of our reactions thereby become de defensive. And so we start to, to, to close ourselves because all defensiveness is a form of, of, of needing to close oneself. Um, there's some psychologists will say that, you know, it's this process of, of going into reactive mode to, to the world around us, to the, the circumstances, the people who are projecting at us or projecting into the environment that we share these negative energies. It's how we're dealing with those energies that actually um, sets up how we form our own personalities. And, 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 and this is the beginning of, of what makes us all different, all have different personalities. So in this sense, um, we're coming into a, an insecure environment. <laughs> and, and of course, it's different for different people. There are moments, of course, where, where we're able to, to find a sense of security. But generally speaking, we, we kind of have to deal with a, a set of circumstances, a context in which um, we don't feel totally secure. The second stage, stage two, is, um, is what we call, what you might call the comfort blanket stage. <laughs> and it's when we, we grasp something or someone or some object. And, um, and this becomes the object of our comfort. And, um, and, and the reason it becomes the object of our comfort is, again, it's this kind of the beginning of our search for for the sense of security that we came with. And whatever that object is, whatever that person is, whatever that um, comfort blanket is, it's just a, a metaphor basically, we grab onto it. And the reason it gives us our sense of security is it's, it seems to be unchanging. It seems to give us a, a stability, a sense of stability in our life. And so we, we create, we hold on to our comfort blanket. And then the third stage is when we start the learning process. And um, the learning process is, is growing through our younger years into school and, and into adulthood, basically. And it's where we learn, it's where we learn from those around us that our sense of security has to come from outside. In other words, it has to come from um, uh, money or from position or from a group of friends and in other words it it comes from outside in and, and, and so we learn to go searching for objects for people for situations for contexts if you like which will give us which will represent for us uh, uh, this sense of security and, and of course this is um, um, uh, combined with the, the fatal belief that we all learn, essentially, uh, at some stage during this process, where we look at others believing that they will be the source of what I feel. In other words, other people will be responsible for the feelings that I have within myself. So this learning process, which, um, as a combination of seeking a sense of security externally and trying to bring it from outside in and combined with the idea that other people are responsible for how I feel, this is, it's kind of fatal really. This is, this is guaranteeing we're going to make ourselves feel insecure for a very long time. <laughs> maybe the rest of our life, maybe the rest of your life. 
sure there are moments when parents uh you know pro probably when we're very young they are they they do provide moments of unconditional love and and stability and and, and there are moments and in, in those probably very close intimate relationships where we do feel um, secure. But the older we become, um, the less those moments are, the less in terms of time and the less frequent they become, the, the more we, we grow into adulthood. So we kind of grow up um, being dependent on external people, situations, objects, um, positions, achievements, fame, etc. We kind of grow up being dependent on those things to give us very momentary feelings of, aha, now I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay in this moment. And so uh, essentially we become dependent on some kind of stimulation. And so we fear um, the loss of that stimulation. We fear the loss of, of, um, of our sources of security. And so that's what all fear is. All fear is, is a fear of loss of something. And so that anxiety, that fear begins to invade and pervade our life, essentially. And, and um, that's why there's that other old saying is that people tend to live their lives with, um, with a quiet anxiety in the background almost all the time. And it's just that we learn to tolerate it and learn to live with it. <clears throat> so this is the reason or the core reason, if you like, that we become attached to and dependent on um, something outside of ourself. And, and if you ask most psychologists or really anyone who's done any inner spiritual self-awareness work, they'll tell you that that's also be what becomes the basis of, um, of the ego. Because what is ego? Ego is essentially um, the, the attachment to an identification with what is not me. <laughs> and, and everything around me is not me. And so my ego, my sense of who I am, becomes dependent on something that I'm not, which is can be anything, anyone, anywhere um, in the world outside. And of course, no one teaches us that the, the, the two realities in life, the external reality and, and uh, an internal reality. And the reason why we can't find security in the external reality is that it's always changing. It's always moving. It's always shifting. It's never stable. It's never a place where you can find or base your sense of self-security upon. Once again, if you walk down any wisdom path or any spiritual path, essentially, the, 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 the one thing that most of them have in common is this idea that our security has to come from the primary reality in our life, which is um, the reality of our own consciousness. Um, but no one teaches us how to explore that reality. And, and for most of us, it's also a reality that's constantly changing. Our thoughts are constantly changing, our, our moods, and certainly the behaviors of other people are unpredictable and, and their desires are changing. And so it seems all around us, it's very difficult to find this inner sense of stability or security that would make us feel okay in ourselves at anywhere, anytime, in any context. And that's why, um, I guess, and I, I will stand corrected should, should anyone who's listening, who's connecting to this to series of ideas tonight wishes to challenge me, and I, and I hope you do, and please do give me a hard time. Um, that's why um, the, the primary methodology to restore, to bring my sense of security, my sense of stability from inside out, from the primary reality, the reality of my own consciousness, has always been and, and will always be some form, some practice of meditation. 
because essentially meditation is is the cultivation of self-awareness and it's a very simple definition uh, and the cultivation of self-awareness is actually the deepest thing the deepest endeavor the the deepest journey that you can probably ever make and most people they try meditation and they try to go inside and and that's where they find their own instabilities very quickly and their own instabilities at the level of thought the level of feeling the level of their desires even the level of their intentions all fluctuate almost all the time and so when someone tries to meditate for the first time kind of maybe they've been listening to someone like me who's been recommending it and they try it and 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 they watch all these thoughts and feelings and attentions and and, and so on all floating by all floating into their awareness all the time they think wow what's going on in here i think i prefer the universe around me on the outside i prefer to be stimulated by other people i prefer to be chasing to be achieving to 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 be on my keyboard all day and so they give up quite fast but once again if you explore um more spiritual path wisdom path whatever you want to call it or the people who seriously practiced some kind of meditation over time most of them will, will 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 kind of maybe not all of them will use the metaphor many of them will use the met metaphor of it, it it's a bit like drilling for oil is that to get to the oil a long way underground requires a lot of drilling so to to meditate and and get to to cultivate a level of self-awareness that's very deep requires quite a bit of practice and um, just as the the oil company might invest a lot of time and energy over a long space of time to strike oil once they do they realize that they have found the richest vein under the ground which is going to sustain them and provide them with certainly material stability for a long time to come and so meditation itself uh, is is a a practice that requires exactly the same patience time persistence um, and and eventually what it's going to do is restore myself my pure self-awareness not the awareness of what i'm thinking not the awareness of what i'm feeling not the awareness of my intentions or my desires or or my emotional state i've got to kind of drill like the oil company drills through the ground i have to drill through all of those and allow myself to i think um arrive back at what some people term their their true nature their their natural state of being that original state of being that i came with at the very start um when you meditate there's a a discovery that you make not very long after you experiment a little bit it's usually just a little taste to begin with and it's this thing um, that we call peace and this is because the the natural state of being the natural state of consciousness um, of every being is one of silence it's one of stillness and when you taste that through some kind of practice of of meditation when you touch that then you you feel it begins to shape your feelings and shape your thoughts on the way back out and and that's sometimes called peace and then when that peace becomes stable again within your consciousness it's not something that can be disturbed by anything on the outside when that peace is touched when that silence is 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 touched or tasted within your consciousness then its expression it wants to press itself out naturally express press itself outwards it wants to do that naturally because we are living in two realities the inner and the outer and we get the chance to be creative in the outer reality of the world around us and so that peace naturally wants to express the being of consciousness naturally wants to express 
and the expression of that inner silence, stillness, that peace, is what we call love. The world, or the word, the, 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 the purpose of life in a sense of, of being in the world, in, in six words, peace is, love does, and happiness rewards. And it's only when you're happy that you can feel secure. In fact, security and happiness, contentment, really is the deepest form of happiness, are almost the same thing. And so love is the key. And we kind of know it's the key. You know, when, when um, someone says to you, oh, I love you, 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 you feel fantastic when you're receiving some kind of love from another person. It's unfortunate that that, that love then tends to turn into a, a form of dependency. Or when you say to someone or you do something for someone and it's a, a, a loving act, it's a I love you um, um, enactment, then you also feel very secure in yourself, very stable in yourself. In both instances, the anxiety Kind of disappears the insecurity disappears it's not a it's not even crossing your mind you you just feel very secure in yourself either in receiving it or in in giving it and so love is the key so the key is to bring love to our relationships and, and in a sense that's what life is all about is an opportunity to use the energy of love in whatever way is appropriate and whatever creative ways we feel is appropriate in the situation and the context that we find ourselves in. However, to tap into that, I need to become more self-aware. And, and it, it's like when you learn to meditate and you cultivate that deeper level of self-awareness, and you find the peace, the stability, the silence, the stillness, that's already and always there within yourself. And then you begin to express that, then that is what you could call true love. And in that moment, um, I would hope, and it doesn't happen for everyone at, at every moment, but I would hope there is the realization that love is not something separate. It's not something that, that you acquire. It's not something that has to be proved. It, it is simply what I am. And maybe the word love is not the right word. Maybe because the baggage that comes with love is, is uh, Hollywood love, is romantic love, is sexual love. And that tends to be the baggage, the association that occurs in our consciousness. Maybe the word love is not the best word. Maybe care is the best word. And when you care for something or someone or some situation, when you give of your, yourself in the form of caring, then that is what's called love in action. And, and sometimes um, we use the word virtue. You are being virtuous. In other words, Virtue is love in action. And so if you think about life, the moment we arrive, the moment we leave, it's a, a series of relationships. And every relationship is an opportunity to, to create virtue in action, to be virtuous. If you like to boil it down to one word as care, that's okay. But how many ways can you be virtuous in the context of your relationships. So many ways, compassion, trust, respect, empathy. There's so many ways to shape and give the energy of love in the context of our relationships. And when you do, when you genuinely do, you'll notice that security is not an issue. Anxiety disappears. Um, being alone, is not an issue. Loneliness is not feared. That's kind of disappears. So the practice of meditation restores your ability 
to touch the deepest level of self-awareness. And the deepest level of self-awareness is your natural state. It's very peaceful, it's still, it's silent, it's your power, in a sense it's the, the opposite of the material world, the secondary reality, where the expression of power is movement. But in consciousness, in the being that we are, the representation of power is stillness, it's silence. It's the original sense of security, it's the original sense of, of being complete in myself. And so when that is tasted, when that's touched through the practice of meditation, then it's easy to come out into action, to create actions, to create responses in the context of our relationships, which express that power, that stillness, that silence, bring that into life, and that's what we call love in action. It cannot be negative because it's your original natural state and that state is pure, it's positive, it's powerful. It cannot be distorted because you're not holding on to anything in that state, you're not attached to anything. And that's what distorts the energy of our consciousness is our attachment to and dependency upon anything or anyone. So when you find your inner peace, when you express that in the context of your relationships, peace is, love does, in other words, virtue expresses itself, and happiness, contentment, which is the deepest form of happiness, is the reward. And then there's no thought of loneliness, aloneness there's no neediness there's no dependency all of that kind of disappears naturally you don't have to fight it you don't have to resist it you don't have to get rid of it um, there's no judgment of it it's just no longer present within your consciousness it's no longer an expression a pressing out into your behavior in the context of your relationships and of course, life is relationship. So love is the key. Love is the answer. It's not a new idea. It's an ancient wisdom. And, um, and it is what we are. It is what I am. It's not something that I have to acquire. It's not something that can be brought from outside in. It is already what I am. It's just unfortunate that it's associated today with all the things that are not love. And, uh, and we tune into our, our, our eye pads and ear pads and knee pads and, and head pads or whatever, and we are taught to believe that love comes from outside in, that love is only possible when it's acquired from someone else in our life. And what no one teaches us is it's already there. It's already a natural state of being. But like the drilling company, we have to go and drill for it. And that is what the practice of meditation is. The cultivation of deeper levels of self-awareness. So I think um, that's enough from me. Let me um, see if there's any questions or anything which is not working for you or anything that's not clear or anything that I've said that... Um... Okay, Mike, um, so there's a few questions okay. starting to come in. So um, when, is a re when does a relationship become a bondage? When does relationship become a bondage? Can you still see me? Yes. Okay. Um, a relationship becomes a bondage when um, Whenever there's some kind of dependency, either um, the relationship starts with a, a dependency where one person is dependent on another and uh, it can continue that way or it starts with both individuals dependent on each other. Sometimes that's called codependency. That's not a new idea. 
Um, but if there's any dependency, then um, as each person interacts and then go away from each other, there is a, a, a resentment. There is a, a desire and neediness which arises with that dependency. And um, that eventually grows into something called hate. And this is why you, you get into relationships, love-hate relationships. One minute there is a harmony, there seems to be uh, a loving interaction. But the next minute is you want to be away from the person or they want to be away from you. They want to be alone. And in a sense, this is not wrong. It's not bad. It's kind of like it's sometimes necessary to spend time on your own and to recharge your battery. And before going back into the interaction of the relationship, sometimes that's necessary. But if you're going back into the relationship with any resentment, then then that resentment is your burden. It's your creation. Um, the illusion that we have to overcome in that context is it's the other person who's responsible for me feeling that resentment. Is It's not the other person, it's my own creation. It's my responsibility. It's my uh, ability to respond to them, which is not coming from a place of love. It's coming from a place of anger. So um, maybe then it's necessary to to go apart for a while, or maybe it's necessary to have a conversation about how we're feeling about each other in that particular situation. And then hopefully it, it resolves over time. Okay, next question. Do you not believe that we as humans have a biological wiring that creates the need to spend our life with another person in the form of a life partner? If not, how else do you see it? Um, some people, they, they often ask me, do you not have a life partner? And my, one of my answers is, is that I have many partners. Is that if you try and make your life of human relationship exclusive, um, then what you're doing is you're cutting off the richness of many relationships in the process. So if there's one particular person that you are um, attracted to, then it's necessary to explore what's the level of the attraction. Is it just a physical level or is it a deeper level? Sometimes people call the deeper level the vibrational level. Sometimes it's called, I found my soulmate. And, and so you hang out with them a little bit more than you might do with other people. But if you cut other people off because you believe in the exclusivity of this one relationship, then only you will know, you know your motivation to do that. Are you being selfish? Are you narrowing your ability to, to be loving to a wider group of people? Are you shutting down your creative capacity to express yourself in that process? And that's what many people do. And so if there's any attachment in, in that exclusive one-on-one -on -one relationship, if there's any attachment whatsoever, and sometimes and very often there is, and, and that attachment is mistaken for love, then there must be moments of rejection, of resistance, of, of resentment. There must be moments that arise like that. And, uh, and so many people, they spend their whole lives in such relationships without really understanding why and why it's necessary to be alone for periods of time, maybe short, maybe long, um, in each of our lives. We come alone, we go alone, we're naturally alone. It's our nature to be alone, but of course life is relationship. So it's necessary to have both. So each one of us gets the chance to find our balance between the two. So if there's a lot of attachment in the relationship, therefore a lot of resentment and resistance to the other or periods of, then those are the signals that I need to go away and, and I need to be alone. And if there's real love in the relationship, the other person will understand that or I'll understand why they need to be uh, spending a little bit of time alone because it's only when you're alone that you can recharge your spiritual batteries, if you like. And that's another way of saying when you can 
dig down through those levels of self-awareness and find your own personal power, find your own stability, your own sense of, of security within yourself in that context. So it's, a, it's not a clear answer to the question, but it's a question of, of being able to have both. And if there's any attachment in the relationship, it's not love, it's attachment. Attachment is not love. Um, how can we specifically focus on self-compassion and self-love when meditating? <laughs> well, for me, um, uh, you know, self-love and self-compassion are oxymorons, <laughs> which means they're contradictions in terms. It is not possible to love yourself. There's no... I love myself. There's no subject and object within yourself. There's no object to the love that you are. When you're being loving in the context of any relationship at any moment in time, the, the last thing you're thinking is, uh, <laughs> I love myself. <laughs> um, but it's not easy to overcome the illusion that is been deeply programmed into most of us that is that you can't love others unless you love yourself um, <laughs> and so most of us because we're in a, a relationship of attachment with the world with objects with people is that we we don't know what love is so we go searching for love love is the ultimate security we go searching for it outside and so when we don't get it from outside when we get resentment and anger and irritation and frustration from others we feel unloved and, and and because we believe we should be loved we feel unloved and we so we think well if no one else is going to love me i might as well love myself <laughs> and so this affirms the illusion that you can love yourself i often use the example at least once a year we give someone a gift or at some stage and we say this is from me to you with a lot of love this is me giving my, what represents love from my heart to you. And in that moment, the love that you give to that person is not in the box, not in the gift. It's, not, it's, it's coming from within your consciousness. And in that moment, you are love. That's what consciousness is in its highest state. Love is just a word that describes consciousness at its highest state, whether you call it high state of intention or high state of vibration or whatever. And so love is what I am. It's what I am in that moment. And the last thing we're thinking in that moment is, is I have to love me. No, love is what I am. And, and I feel it first as I give it. And so the feeling of love is only possible when you are being loving. It's like a, a brilliant design feature of human consciousness is that you can only know love is what you are. You can only know true love when you give it away, when you are being loving, truly, authentically, with someone. And the last thing you're thinking in that moment is, <laughs> I need to love myself. <laughs> so that, it's a short answer to, to the question. Thank you. Um, what can one do about weak connections? Often loneliness is less about having people around you and more about not having depth and quality of relationship. Um, yes, the, the, the depth and the quality, again, that you feel you're not getting from another, <clears throat> it's just a judgment of the other at that moment. The depth and the quality that you're seeking really has to come from inside out as well. If you're deep and your 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 consciousness is of the highest quality, then there won't be the judgment. There won't be the looking down uh, at another and saying, well, they're superficial. They don't need to be listened to. There's something, something not quite right with them. You won't be coming from that judgmental space. You know, you, you will, in a sense, this is this brings us back to the previous question of compassion, is that you will just understand that, that their level of self-awareness has not yet discovered within themselves 
their own depth and their own quality, if you like. And, and, and so you, you understand that. That's what compassion does. It has understanding. And there's an empathy towards that. And so you're coming from a place of empathy and compassion in that relationship. And those are deep places within you. And so that, that's what satisfies you, not like a, you satisfy with eating or drinking something, but the, a satisfaction of your spirituality, if you like, is, is, is when you can see someone like that. And so the depth and the quality is coming from inside out. And when it's coming from inside out, then it doesn't matter what other people are like, what level and, and, and what state they're in, is, is that you're able to accept everyone as they are, as you meet them, as they come to you in that moment. Okay. You mentioned that love is a natural state of being. Yeah. But does it not partly depend on your experience of how people have generally treated you in life. For example, if someone has been abused or bullied had, or had terrible things happen to them. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, those uh, recordings, those memories exist in your consciousness and they get in the way of, um, of you being a more loving, open, accepting of others being, certainly. And this is why meditation um, becomes really quite essential because, because when you meditate and you, you deepen your level of self-awareness, you come through, you wake your way through those memories. Those memories cease to get in the way of you expressing yourself. They cease to be um, an interference patterns as you create your responses to others your responses become clearer and cleaner because you're coming from a deeper level of awareness within yourself. So the deepest level of awareness is when those memories, uh, this programming, this conditioning, those beliefs that you've learned have no power to shape how you think and how you feel anymore. And so meditation takes you beyond, if you like, higher than or deeper than um, the existence of those memories. So it's not that you have to fight them off. It's not that you have to throw them out. It's not that you have to reject them or question them. But if you're, if you're genuinely um, drilling for your oil, if you like, in other words, genuinely deeping your levels of self-awareness and you reach your core, silent, peaceful state within, you reach the source of your power and all those memories, they become so small and insignificant. And, and you realize, well, they're just, they just are. They're just memories. They're just stories that I keep re-energizing and telling myself. And what am I doing that for? That's a waste of time and energy. And so you, you access this power and you bring this to the surface of your life. It, it's, it's not difficult to theorize about all of this, but it really won't make a difference until you actually practice until one actually goes into and tastes and touches this inner space we're going to come back to the meditation in a moment there's a few questions there but okay. um are you saying it is not right to have codependency even when you're not lonely or feel alone it's not quite possible for couples or families mum and child to be independent <laughs> yes. <laughs> nothing is right and nothing is wrong. It, I, I, I hope you, it's not easy for anyone listening to any information. It's not easy for them not to filter it through the filters of right and wrong. Well, I shouldn't be, I should be. I haven't and I must and I mustn't and, I, and so on. It's not easy because it's, it's just part of our conditioning from the day we arrive. And, and our education, our teachers, they taught us, this is right, that's wrong, that's right, this is wrong. So it's not easy for us to filter. And, and, and I'm asking you, please don't filter what I've been saying as one is right and one is wrong. In, in the universe of consciousness, the inner reality of our own beings, there's no right and wrong. And whatever space, state, feeling you're in right now is fine. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not right, it's not wrong. It's just where you're at right now. And if you're really dependent on someone right now, then fine. But be aware of that dependency. Now I'm interested 
and how I feel, the emotions that I create when I'm interacting dependently with that person. Now I'm interested now, I don't feel comfortable and I, I feel anxious that they're, that they're not going to be present for me all the time. So there's anxiety and there's discomfort. Oh, that's interesting. So now wait a minute, they're not creating that, I'm creating, oh, why am I creating anxiety? And, and so now I'm beginning to ask myself, become more aware really of what I'm feeling. And I'm asking myself, why am I creating these feelings? And, and some people will say, well, you know, I've been feeling like this all my life. And so what's the point of trying to change it? If I'm comfortable being uncomfortable, that's, that's fine. And that's okay. You can do that. But after a while, those feelings will become more frequent. They'll become deeper. They'll become more intense. And maybe there'll come a moment when you say, wait a minute, I just don't want to feel like this anymore. And so that's when you become interested in this kind of information, this kind of universe. In the context of families, it's, it's not easy to, to, to be independent in a set of relationships where there is tremendous dependency or interdependency. Interdependency is the key word, is that, is that we are, even in the context of our families, we are all alone, we are all independent. That's the reality of our being. But of course, we've made ourselves dependent because we become very attached to each other, especially in families. So we made ourselves dependent. And, and here I'm not talking about physical dependency. I'm dependent on the farm or the, the supermarket, dependent on other people physically. But I'm not talking physically, I'm talking about emotionally. And, um, and we've made ourselves very dependent emotionally. In other words, we need the stimulation of others of the TV, of the keyboard, of the other person, to feel okay in ourselves. That's become our addiction. And so if I don't get that, then I feel, I feel isolated, I feel alone, I feel lonely. I, I'm not being stimulated. And so that's okay, it's not a problem, but it is a problem um, when I begin to feel that more intensely and, and I start to really suffer after a while. And that's when I need to remind myself, well, I'm, I'm actually a free spirit, I'm independent, no one controls me. And so I'm in this context, this set of relationships. Um, can, I, can I be interdependent instead of being dependent? And, and you ask most um, organizations, most teams, is that they try to get to the stage of, of being independent individuals, but interdependent in a set of relationships, which is, is a state of non-dependency. I'm not dependent on you, but we're kind of dependent on each other to get things done, to achieve things together but I'm not dependent on you emotionally for how I feel within myself. So we're interdependent as we work together, as we live together, we interdependent to, to, to cooperate with each other, but we're independent as individual beings. <clears throat> and, and this is the, the healthy way, the, the, the healthy way to relate to, to other people. But that's a seminar on its own. All right. Um, a couple of questions on meditation. I'm just going to put them all together. Okay. Is there an easy way to meditate? Is, there, is it possible to maintain that peace of mind or that inner state of peace when you stop meditating? Um, there's many thoughts and questions uh, which create confusion, doubt and lack of trust. Um, so how am I to become... I feel attached to overthinking. So how do I convince myself to stop? How do I convince the voices in my head to collaborate instead of conflict and turn them into trust, calm and clarity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, uh, you, uh, some people say meditation is easy. Some people say it's very difficult. It's just so different for different people. And um, uh, the secret is, is uh, I need a little bit of information to begin with. And, and that gives me a, a sort of gentle focus to begin with. And that focus helps me put all the other stuff to one side all the interfering patterns, the voices, the thoughts, the feelings that will, will definitely come up when you sit quietly on your own, especially if you're not used to sitting quietly on your own. A little bit of information um, 
helps me sort of get centered and focused. But it's not a piece of information that I have to hold on to and get attached to and stick with. And it's this um, very simple idea of, of, um, of who I am. It's the oldest idea, the deepest idea. And it's this, uh, this simple idea that, that I'm a being of consciousness. Whether you call it soul, spirit, consciousness, psyche, or the I that says I am. I sometimes use that phrase. I'm just the I that says I am. In other words, I'm not what I see in the bathroom mirror in the morning. And so if I can consider myself to be the I, to be the spiritual being, the being of consciousness, they're all synonymous. And, and I meditate on that and, and I begin to deepen my level of self-awareness. You'll naturally begin to feel more peaceful. You'll naturally begin to feel quieter on the inside. The voices will naturally, don't have to fight them, don't have to resist them. They'll naturally begin to, to fall away until you realize, well, I've been meditating for, well, looks like five or 10 minutes now. And, and, and those voices haven't bothered me. Those thoughts haven't bothered me. And so, you know, it's different for different people. I, I don't know if that's going to be your experience instantly, but if you use that one simple piece of information, as a starting point, then it's not that you believe it, please don't believe what I'm saying, but you don't hold it as a belief. You just, well, let's see, let's see if, 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 um, if I am this being of consciousness, then and my nature is to be at peace within myself. If that, if it's as simple as that, let's see if I can, I can, I can feel that within me. And, and if you give yourself a moment's chance, it's just for a moment. <laughs> It's not difficult to create the feeling of peace. I mean, just, just a thought, just I'm feeling very peaceful. I feel quite peaceful. And maybe I don't feel as peaceful as I could feel. But if I just say I'm feeling really peaceful, I feel really peaceful right now. I feel really quiet and calm and peaceful right now. And here I am. Here it is. It's, it's very peaceful. And I'm at peace. And there it is. And I've just created it. And, and I feel it. I'm feeling peaceful right now. I am that. And suddenly all the voices have gone, all the thoughts have gone, all the interference has gone, just maybe for a few moments to begin with. But those few moments give you the sign that, well, let's expand those moments, let's deepen those moments, let's go deeper within myself, let's explore. <clears throat> now, when you come out into the world of action and interaction with others, and you try to bring that peacefulness, that state of being into the context of your relationships, that's when you find yourself challenged. That's when people will say things that will press your buttons and, and, and you'll react and, and you'll feel peaceless again. So that means I've got to come back to what sometimes is called the cushion or the chair or the corner and just be quiet, just find my inner peace, which is my nature, my natural state of being, because I feel most natural when I'm in this state. Let me restore it and then come back out again. And now it's becoming like breathing. I breathe in, sit quietly, learn to meditate, develop the capacity to go deeper and deeper, to deepen my level of self-awareness. And I come back out into action and reaction and interaction and come back in, come out, come in. It's like breathing. And I, I'm breathing with my consciousness, not with my body, with my consciousness. I'm kind of out, acting, not doing too well. Well, lost the plot there. And I'm, well, that's okay. Come back in. And that's why it, it, it's necessary to, to build that kind of practice into your daily life in, in some way or other, to some extent or other. And then you give yourself the best chance to, to master your state of being. But if you just sit for meditation and you go, oh, I was very peaceful for five minutes and then I got up and I talked to someone and, and I felt very upset. Oh God, this meditation doesn't work. Well, it, it, it's, not going to, it's not going to work if you give up. It's just like anything else, it requires that little bit of practice and perseverance, really. There are loads of more questions. I'm sure there are. <laughs> can you record them? Can you write them down? Can you copy I them? Yeah, okay. I will copy them and okay. maybe we could do another podcast for people. 
in the future. Um, but we will come back to them for sure. I was wondering, Mike, we're almost out of time. Would you lead us into a meditation? Okay. <clears throat> so as our topic tonight is um, the reason why we fear loneliness and why it's difficult to be alone, let's um, focus our attention around the idea of how easy it is to be alone. I'm going to ask you not to look at the screen, but maybe just listen to the words. If you're watching me on the screen, then you're liable to be evaluating and thinking about what you're seeing. So just rest your eyes somewhere, either to the side of the screen or to a point in front of you, or even close your eyes, it doesn't really matter. And um, I'll share a few thoughts, and then you can see if you can come with me within your consciousness. So I just begin by reminding myself that who I am, what I am, just this being of consciousness. Just the I that says I am. Some people use the word spirit or soul or just consciousness. But certainly I'm aware. I'm aware that I am me. And there are thoughts arising within me. So I just let those thoughts come and go. Let those feelings come and go. And I just watch. And I can see quite clearly there's me. And there are thoughts, there are feelings. And they are not me. But I'm going to use my thoughts, my feelings to create a deeper level of awareness within myself. I consciously create one thought. I am a being of peace. I allow that thought to slowly move across my mind. And then I allow it to dissolve into the background. And I notice what remains. There's a feeling of peace. I feel quiet and calm. There's a stillness here at the heart of my being. My mind is silent. Silent and still. Silent. And still. Then I bring my awareness 
back out into the world. So I become aware of the room around me, the objects in front of me, but I bring that stillness with me. So I see through these eyes from that stillness. I listen through these ears from that stillness. And as I do, I'm aware this is my natural state of being. Thank you. Thank you.